Well, welcome to another Friday night. We've been working our way through the 60 characteristics of complex trauma, doing one week on each of the characteristics so we can do a deep dive into really understanding that particular characteristic. And today we come to change in priorities. And of all the 60 characteristics, this is probably the one that is least evident to understand just by reading change in priorities. So I, I need to begin by just explaining what this is all about and then show how it's still an issue for most people who come out of complex trauma. So here's the big picture. If you think of a healthy family, you have parents, children, and basically the priority in that family is love. We are here to care for each other, to meet each other's needs. And if we work together, we can all get our needs met. Sometimes it will mean that I have to sacrifice my needs temporarily in order to meet your needs. Sometimes you'll sacrifice your needs temporarily in order to meet my needs. But overall, the amount of sacrifice that takes place will be 50-50. Everybody will get their needs met with some sacrifices made. So that is the commitment of love within a family. We're all equal, we're all equally important, and it's about loving each other, meeting each other's needs, and it's not one person who gets their needs met all the time, but never makes a sacrifice. No, there's a give and a take that is constantly happening. Now bring in complex trauma. Constant danger for a child constantly feeling threatened. In order to survive in that environment, a child has to say the priority can no longer be loving others. The priority has to be surviving. And that means that my needs are a wee bit more important than your needs. That means that I have to be more important than you if I am going to survive in danger. And very subtly, a shift in priorities from love at the core to survival takes place. And what I want you to think about is the ramifications of that shift in priorities. It may not seem like a big deal on the surface, but it is a huge deal. So let me put it this way. When a person is in danger in complex trauma and they shift into survival is now my priority, what basically they are doing is becoming a narcissist. Not, I'm not using this in a bad sense, but they are just a narcissist by definition and it's got to be about me. It's got to be about what I want. It's got to be about my agenda. It's got to be about my needs. And so if I'm going to survive, I have to be in control. And if you're not cooperating with my agenda, I either manipulate you or lash out at you so that you do co cooperate. And I might even do some very hurtful things, but that's the only way I am going to survive and not get hurt repeatedly. And so a child, not intending to, becomes a little narcissist. Now what happens then is in cases of extreme trauma, you can get a person who ends up becoming a pure narcissist as they move into adult life. They think they're better than everybody. They always want to look good. They have no concern or empathy about others. They don't know how to love people. They just become great at using people. And so they would get diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder. But that's the extreme case. Now, most people that come out of complex trauma don't become pure narcissists. I want you to understand that. But the key thing to understand is that though they're not a pure narcissist, their limbic brain remains a narcissist. And so in their day-by-day -day life, they can be living out of their cortex, <clears throat> which isn't a narcissist. 
And in their cortex, they can be loving others. But as soon as their limbic brain becomes triggered, they become a narcissist. And all of the narcissistic tendencies kick in. So what does that mean? They can be the nicest person in the world. They are living out of their cortex brain. They're serving people. People admire them. They have great character. They are, they're just wonderful people. But then they get triggered. And it's like a different person comes out. And this person is marked by certain characteristics. So the first thing is emotional dysregulation. All of a sudden, their emotions are out of, the control, out of control, over the top. They go from zero to 100, and usually it's anger, fear, panic. But it is emotional craziness. And within a nanosecond, it happens. It's not a gradual thing. It's something triggers them, and an explosion takes place in a nanosecond. When that takes place, not only do their emotions go crazy, but their thinking gets distorted. And their perception of events gets distorted. They think they're seeing everything clearly, but they're really not. They think they're thinking clearly, but they're really not. Their thinking and perception is now controlled by how they're feeling. And so in that moment of time, you can't reason with them. You can't sit down and explain to them how it really is. They can't see that. The next thing that happens is that when they're in that state, they think they're 100% right. Everybody else is wrong. Everybody else is at fault for what is happening but not them. They don't see their own part in what is going on. And so there's a, a loss of control that takes place. When they're escalated like that, all the internal boundaries and the filters they used to have around what they would do and say seem to disappear. They maybe had a filter before that said never say anything disrespectful, when they're escalated, all kinds of disrespect comes out of their mouth. They may have had an internal boundary that said don't hit anything, but when they're escalated, they are hitting things. So this massive change takes place, and this person goes from being a saint to being a crazy person in a nanosecond. Something has triggered them. So let me give you a couple examples just in case you're still not quite getting a clear picture of what I'm talking about. Let's say that you're in a program and you're required to be there 90% of the time attendance-wise and you're required to remain abstinent from drug and alcohol. But you are missing two or three days a week. And the people talk to you and warn you. They give you a contract that you sign and say you'll be there every day. But you keep missing, and so they kick you out of the program. And all of a sudden, you just go crazy. And you're phoning people, and you're threatening to, threatening to phone the news channel to report this organization because they kicked you out, and you were actually sick that day. That's why you weren't there. You don't think of the other days you weren't there. You just think of that one day, and how could they kick me out when I was sick that day? And you lose it. Or another example might be, let's say you're in a serious relationship with somebody and you see that your partner's phone lights up and you notice that it's from a text from his old girlfriend. You don't sit and ask what this is about calmly. You just go crazy. You go, you're cheating on me. You're back with her. And away you go and you can't be reasoned with. Or let's say your partner sits down one night with you and says, you know what, <clears throat> we're just not working out. I think it's time for me to move on. So they tell you they're going to be breaking up. 
Well, that, you just go crazy. And now the next day, you're just sending like a thousand texts to them. You're phoning them. You're begging them to stay. You're promising to do whatever they want you to do just as long as they stay. <clears throat> you just go very crazy. Or let's say you've been building a, a friendship with somebody in your recovery journey and you text with them a couple times a day. But maybe you start texting them more often and then more often. And so they say to you, they set a boundary and say, please just text to me in the morning and in the evening. Don't text me all day long, hundreds of texts. And you feel rejected. You feel they're saying you're bad. And you just lose it. You go crazy. You tell them they're a terrible friend. If they were a good friend, they'd be there for you. And, and on and on you go in a rant at this person. Those are some examples of what I'm talking about. So in all those cases, you've been in a really good place. You've been doing really well. You, you've just been in a very healthy behaviors. But when that trigger takes place, you go back to old behaviors. You go back to very unhealthy ways of dealing with things. So that's what we're talking about. So let me just pause here and give you the story of narcissists. So we're talking about our limbic brain after complex trauma remains a narcissist. So what are we talking about? So narcissist is based on the Greek myth. And narcissist was a handsome young man. And all kinds of women fell in love with him and wanted a relationship with them. But he did not reciprocate that love. He was inaccessible to love. His heart was hard. And so one of those people, one of the rejected lovers was Nemesis. And so he went to the gods and wanted them to punish Narcissus for his unfeeling heart. For his inability to love back when people were pouring love on him. And so what happened is that this was the curse. One day, Narcissus bent down at a pool of water to get a drink, and he saw his reflection in the water, and he fell in love with himself. He was so overwhelmed with his own beauty that he fell in love with himself. But here's the curse. He couldn't actually get love back from a reflection. So now the very thing he had done to others, his reflection was doing to him. He was wanting to love his reflection. He would spend all day drooling over his reflection, loving it, but nothing was coming back. And so his love was being unrequited. His love was not being returned. He was experiencing what he had done to others. So what do we see? It's a story of unrequited love. Somebody who can't give love back, but also somebody who becomes obsessed with themselves. Okay, let me take it further. The word narcissist comes from narc. And it's from the word we use, narcotic. And what do we mean when we say this person needs a narcotic? It's something that will deaden their feelings so they don't feel pain. And so narcissist, the third characteristic is he was unable to feel. It was like he was on a narcotic. And so narcissism becomes a person who is so obsessed with self they don't know how to love others, and they don't feel. And that is the story of Narcissus. Now what is very interesting is the story doesn't end there. It ends that after that Narcissus dies, but then a flower is born. It comes up. And that flower 
gives, gives us hope. And what it is saying is this. For a narcissist, beauty can't come to life until they die to that self-obsession. Until they die to that only loving self and not loving others. Once they die to that, then beauty and life can happen. And so it's a sad, tragic story. And from that, we get the idea of narcissism. But let me take it further. Today, if you were to go to the DSM or the Diagnostic Handbook used by psychiatry, you would find narcissistic personality disorder. And it would have the characteristics of a narcissist. And there's about 18 different characteristics. What I want to focus on are what are the characteristics that show themselves when the limbic narcissist brain is triggered. So you're going along in your cortex, you're very loving, you're, you're very healthy, you get triggered, your narcissist limbic brain kicks in. What comes out? Well, you get very angry. You lash out at others because they're not giving you what you want. They're not being there for you. And so you can say very hurtful. You can do very destructive things. And you can do it in that moment without a conscience. Then, because the danger is also being triggered, you now fight to get into control. So it's not now about your needs versus mine. Who's going to sacrifice? It's now me. I have to be the boss. I have to have everything my way. You have to give me what I want and cooperate with my agenda. If you don't, I will hurt you. So there comes an entitlement, a feeling of you owe me. If you love me, you would do this for me. Entitlement kicks in. And then you blame everybody for how you're feeling. Other characteristics that come out are you can't see. And what we mean by that is when the narcissist limbic brain is triggered, it doesn't see clearly. It lacks insight. It gets tunnel vision. So it says... <gasps> That your ex-girlfriend has just texted you. You must be having an affair. You're cheating on me. You can't see a bigger picture. You get tunnel vision. All you can see is that one thing, not anything beyond that. And then when you're lashing out, when you're going crazy, you don't see how you're hurting others. Because all you can see is your need. And you're absorbed with that. And then when you're blaming everybody, you don't see any of your part. So your, your sight gets very distorted. And that leads to all kinds of wrong conclusions and thinking. And then for many people, when they're triggered, they think the rules don't apply to them. And then you don't care how you're affecting others. You lack feelings towards others. It's all about you, your needs, what you're feeling. Self-absorbed, self-obsession. So that brings us to this question. How can my limbic narcissist brain get triggered? And it's important to understand our triggers so that we can catch it when it happens so we don't stay in that narcissist limbic brain. So we can get back to our cortex, back to healthy. So the big picture is this. What triggers your limbic brain is any past trauma that put you in danger, where you got hurt or wounded badly. So anything that looks or smells like that now will trigger your limbic brain. And so it's important to understand that many of those triggers take place in intimate relationships. So your deepest wounds as a child came from those closest to you. So now you will get triggered 
in relationships with those closest to you. So here are some of the triggers. Anytime you fear that they are rejecting you or might abandon you, that is a huge trigger. And let me just say this. Borderline personality disorder is really all about what we're talking about. It's about people who get triggered and dysregulate. And the common trigger for borderline personality is fear of abandonment, fear of rejection. So that's what happened when that text came from an ex. And that might have just been to ask about one of the kids or to talk about an event that the other person might be interested in. It might have had nothing to do with romance, but it triggered the fear of abandonment. Another common trigger is not getting what you want not getting what you see as your needs and desires met. And that goes to a very old wound, which was, I lived like that growing up. My needs were not met. The only one who could get my needs met was me. And if something blocks that today, I lose it because I have to get my needs met. Or anything that makes them look bad or stupid. And that is anything that triggers their shame. So you could have, be having a discussion with somebody and you say, can I offer some advice? Well, to them, you're saying they're stupid. That's why you have to give them advice. Or you correct them. Or you just present another way of looking at it. But their deep wound is they are always made to look stupid. And so now they feel that maybe that's what you're doing and they lose it. And you can't understand what in the world is going on. But it's triggered their shame. And that shame wound runs very deep. And then another one is if you enforce the consequences of the boundaries that you set. So the person that missed, they, their attendance was poor in their program. The boundary was 90% of the time you be there, they were not there 90% of the time. You warned them. They still weren't there. So you enforce the boundary and they lose it because now they have to face consequences for their behaviors, which they don't want to do. So they find a way to try to blame somebody else. Another one is stress when it starts to get to the point of feeling overwhelmed. Because when you're starting to get to the point of feeling overwhelmed, you're actually afraid you're running out of tools to handle the situation, and that means the chance of you getting hurt is going up, and you're going to lose it. And so being overwhelmed just sends you to a point where all of a sudden it's nobody supporting me. Everybody should be there to help me if they really cared for me. And you go off, especially on those closest to you. Another trigger for many is seeing a lack of justice or experiencing it. So something happens in your life, in, a, in, in your work, in your relations with others, and you don't feel you're treated fairly. And that triggers your lack of justice as a child and you go crazy another one is depression mental health now many with depression anxiety mental health issues they can manage that quite well and still remain healthy but when it starts getting worse they can get to a point where they start to panic that they're not going to be able to cope with life and they are triggered. Jealousy is a very common one that triggers your narcissist limbic brain. Another one that's very interesting and important to understand is if somebody else is being stressed, if somebody else is angry, if somebody else is sad, that could trigger you. I have watched people who they're with their families and dad is upset. And now, all of a sudden, everybody's panicking and running around like chickens with their heads cut off. 
And it's because dad's upset. We, we got to make sure that we take care of dad. A and they, they lose it. And anybody that isn't cooperating to take care of dad is now bad and they lash out at that person. And so the trigger doesn't have to happen internally necessarily in how you're treated. It's just how you respond because of your codependency to when somebody else is not in a good place. So let me add one more piece. All of these triggers are the limbic brain, but all of them also release cortisol in the brain. And cortisol is like booster juice to the brain. It gives you the extra energy to fight or flight. It kicks in adrenaline. And that's why there's that nanosecond response of zero to 100. That's cortisol fueled. And why I tell you that is that when your narcissist limbic brain is triggered, cortisol comes in to aid in that trigger, which makes it even harder to control. So when your limbic brain is triggered, you have a huge challenge on your hands to control it because of cortisol and its powerful effect on your limbic brain. Now, a lot of people... They want to minimize that this is not a big deal. Sure, I have a, a limbic brain that's a narcissist, and it gets triggered once in a while, but I'm in my cortex most of the time, so what's the, what's the big deal? Well, let me give you some of the big deal. It does so much damage to relationships and to your children. It creates a complex trauma environment for your children. You see, it doesn't matter if you're a good dad 95% of the time or 90% of the time and a good husband. It's in those 5 to 10% when you're triggered that the damage gets done, that the kids feel that they can't trust that you're consistent. And that creates an unsettled, uncertain feeling that creates complex trauma for them. Secondly, for many people, their triggers and how they act in the triggers gradually gets more extreme. So they don't stay at the same spot of how they act out when they're triggered. They act out in more extreme ways. So for some, it starts with yelling, and then it goes to being very disrespectful. Then it goes to hitting things. Then it goes to throwing things, then it goes to hitting people and being abusive. So once you allow a certain amount of limbic brain response and you don't take it seriously, it will progress and it will result in becoming more and more abusive. And then for some people, this is a significant issue because you lose jobs because of these outbursts. You lose all kinds of opportunities because the word gets out that you are this kind of person. And it can really damage your career and your job opportunities. Further, afterwards, you're full of regret, full of guilt for the stuff you said, the stuff you did. And it feeds your shame even more. You get so down on yourself and you fear now that people will abandon you because of your behavior in that time. So there are huge results. You might not see them right away, but the damage will gradually become more evident and become greater and greater. So let me just give you this. I've had many people that come to me and they've been hit by their partner. And they say, but you got to understand, they're such a wonderful person. 95% of the time, this is just a bad, they, they were having a bad day. This is just an anomaly. This isn't who they are. And I go, yeah, you're partly right. 
95% of the time, they're in their cortex, they're healthy. But what I want you to understand is this isn't just having a bad day and it will never happen again. This is part of a pattern. This is not an anomaly. This will happen again if they don't deal with the stuff that's getting triggered. And as it keeps happening, it will get worse and worse. So don't minimize it and just say that it's a bad day. Others will say, well, they apologize profusely. They cried. I've never seen them cry with such a broken heart over what they've done. And they promise to never do it again. I believe that promise and I go, I wouldn't. Because it's their limbic brain that's fueled on cortisol. And when it is triggered, it is so hard to stop. And just promising that you won't do it again usually is not enough. They have to do more than just promise that they won't do it again. So what is it that they have to do? So there's two parts to healing. Let me say this. One way to look at healing from complex trauma is to understand that you're healing your limbic brain. That your limbic brain has, because of complex trauma, gone from being a very helpful, useful, wonderful part of being a human to being a very unhealthy, can't-be-trusted, misleading, destructive part of who we are. And so part of the healing journey is healing our, com our limbic brain so it's not the narcissist anymore. To do that, we have to work on two areas. So number one, we need tools for when our limbic brain gets triggered so that we de-escalate and get back into our cortex and don't do a whole bunch of damage. Secondly, we have to heal the parts of us that were triggered so that they're not triggered anymore. And so outside of the times when we're triggered in the rest of our life, the other 95%, we have to be working on healing and growing in repairing the damage done from years ago because of complex trauma. So let me say this. The hardest part of this healing journey is learning to manage when you're triggered. Because, like we said, that cortisol fuels this extreme thing and it happens in a nanosecond. So what you're trying to do is in that nanosecond choosing a different path as to how you'll respond. Instead of going down the old path where everything is wanting to go, where the cortisol is pulling you, in that nanosecond you're choosing to go this way. That is so difficult. And so what I want you to understand is you're not going to do it perfectly the first time. Probably not the second time or the third time. This is going to be a slow journey. But... If after every time you can look back at it and instead of beating yourself up, say, what could I have done differently? In that nanosecond, you can probably think of one thing you could have done differently. And you gradually develop the tools to choose a different path in that nanosecond. But it is very challenging. The second part of this when you're triggered is de-escalating, getting out of the limbic back into the cortex. So before you say anything, before you do anything, de-escalate. And so we talk about grounding as the way to do that. And so you can do deep breathing. You can do tapping on pressure points, which help reduce cortisol. You can go for a walk just to get away from the circumstances. But you need to find something that helps you de-escalate after you've been de-escalated. Now, for some situations, you can de-escalate within a couple minutes. Other situations, it might take you a couple hours because of the intensity. 
But if you can make a deal with yourself that when you're triggered, you bite your tongue and you don't do anything until you can get your emotions back under control and get back into your cortex. So there's another piece to this that I want you to understand. A lot of people get down on themselves that they got triggered. I'm such a terrible person, I keep getting triggered all the time. I shouldn't be so affected by disrespect. I shouldn't be so affected by fear. I shouldn't be so affected by not getting my way. And they get down on themselves. Here's what I would propose to you. Don't get down on yourself about it. But look at a trigger as an old wound telling you where you need to heal next. It is your inner child, your little you saying, ouch, you need to heal here. And so as you use triggers as a guide, as a roadmap, pointing you to the next part of your healing journey, then as you heal, you don't get triggered as often. You don't get triggered as intensely. And as you develop the tools to de-escalate and get back in your cortex, you're able to work through the trigger more quickly until you get to a point where you're not really hardly getting triggered at all in that area. So important to do that. Now let me give you a very important piece of this healing journey, but it takes a lot of humility and trust to be able to do it. If you have somebody in your life that you respect greatly, you trust, they carry a lot of weight in your life, say to them, if you see me triggered and going into my narcissist limbic brain, you have permission to come to me and say, you need a time out. I won't take it as condescending or patronizing. I will take it as you recognizing I'm not in a good place. I'm about to do something I'll regret and you're treating me like a child out of love, not out of trying to shame me. And you're saying, you need to go cool down. If you can have the humility to have somebody like that in your life, you will come to appreciate that. Now, you're not going to need them forever. You're just going to need them for a while until you learn to be able to do that for yourself. With that, you might also say to somebody that you respect very much. I sometimes go into my limbic brain without realizing it. Sometimes there's a severe escalation. Other times it's just a mild escalation, but I start becoming a bit narcissistic, but I'm not aware of it. If you see me starting to act like a narcissist, please point it out to me so that I can become more self-aware of when I'm sliding into that. And you will find that extremely helpful as well. Now let me give you this. If you are in a relationship with somebody who has this narcissist limbic brain, and you find that your relationship is growing, but this when they get triggered, is causing a lot of trouble. You need to find a way to talk to them and say, okay, the next time you go into your limbic brain, I am going to say to you, I can't talk about this now. I'm not going to say that because I am shutting you out. I'm not saying that to judge you or condemn you or say you're bad. That is your cue that you're in your limbic brain and we cannot resolve or have a rational discussion while you're there. And so I'm going to take myself out of the situation and say, I can't talk about this now, but we'll come back to it when you're cooled down. Now you can immediately realize that's hard for somebody to hear. And if you say that to somebody when they're escalated, they might lash out even more. And so that's why you have to find out a way of being able to say that to somebody that you're in a relationship with so that it doesn't end up in a messy, ugly conflict. Okay, that's the end of part one. We're going to take a short break, and then I'm going to come back and do the Christian part. If you're not interested in that, that's no problem at all. We're not offended. You're free to go. We'll see you next week. To everybody else, we'll be back in a minute.
Well, welcome back. We're looking at the life of Peter and finding that he's been a great guide for us in our recovery journey. So many insights that relate to people coming out of complex trauma and trying to get healthier. And what I want to look at today is we will hit times in our recovery journey where we go through a time where we face a very deeply rooted issue. And the growth that takes place is some of the most difficult but rewarding growth. But it is hard to make changes at those deep, deep levels. And what happens for most of us is we can make those changes and do that growth, but that doesn't mean we will never slip back to that old behavior. And a lot of people beat themselves up for that. But what I want you to think about today is Peter did the same thing. Peter shows us that that happens. We will regress. So don't beat ourselves up. One way that many people look at growth or recovery is that it's a linear healing journey. So you can see the straight line. So you go step one, step two, step three, and you make it and it's successful and you move on and you never go back. That's not the journey of healing from complex trauma. It is not a linear journey. The second lines there show what it's like. It's doing well. It's going down. It's going back. It's doing well. It's up and down. It is messy. It is all over. But over time, you see that growth is happening. But we don't like that messy journey. We want it to be a linear journey. But it's not. And we have to accept that and not beat ourselves up for that because if we beat ourselves up, it usually makes us fail even more. So let me read you the story in Acts 10. It said, Peter went up on the flat roof to pray. And it was about noon and he was hungry. And while a meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw the sky open and something like a large sheet was set down by its four corners. In the sheet were all sorts of animals, reptiles, and birds. Then a voice said to him, get up, Peter, kill and eat them. No, Lord, Peter declared, I have never eaten anything that our Jewish laws have declared impure and unclean. But the voice spoke again. Do not call something unclean if God has made it clean. The same vision was repeated three times. Then the sheet was suddenly pulled up to heaven. Peter was perplexed. What could the vision mean? Just then, the men sent by Cornelius, a Gentile, a non-Jew, found Peter at Simon's house. And standing outside the gate, they asked, if a man named Simon Peter was staying there. So let me give you the background. God brought the nation of Israel out of slavery in Egypt and then took them into the desert where they were going to live for the next number of years. And one of the things he does is he creates these food laws. And there's been a lot of discussion as to what's the purpose of these food laws. And I don't know for sure, but I think one of the reasons God did it was because they were living in a culture where you didn't have refrigeration. And so meat would go bad very quickly. And so how do you protect the people from getting food poisoning constantly? So part of the food laws were around living in a culture where there was no refrigeration. And so what came out of that is you could eat sheep, goats, cows, but you couldn't eat pigs. You couldn't eat, you could eat certain kinds of fish, but you couldn't eat shellfish. And so they had these laws. Every Jewish boy and girl had those laws drilled into them. If they asked, could I have this lobster. No, no, no. That would be against God. And it would be reinforced over and over. And everybody in the culture followed it. It marked the culture. 
The other thing that, was, that happened because of that is the Jews kind of twisted it to say, okay, God gave us these laws, but he didn't give non-Jews those laws, so he must care more about us than them. He must love us more than them. And then they found cautions that God gave them about if you're going to have relationships with Gentiles, be careful of. And so now they were starting to think, I think God has made us better than them. I think God is actually giving us the right to be racist towards all those people, to hate them. And so that's how they twisted it, and that's what came out of that. So it wasn't just food laws now, though those were key, it was also were way better than Gentiles. Gentiles, they're bad, we should hate them, have nothing to do with them. So you can imagine when God lowers the sheet to Peter in a dream and says, Peter, here's a pork, I want you to have it. Peter goes, what? And so God has to lower the sheet three times because Peter is really having a hard time accepting that God, you've, you've told it <clears throat> for the last 2,000 years to not eat pork. Now you're saying eat pork. What's go- I, I, this can't be from you, God. I must be just imagining this. And so God has to do it again and again for Peter to start to get, is God changing the law? So just to help you appreciate that, think of some deeply ingrained belief you had since childhood. So your parents may have drilled into you not only that you're to honor them, but that honoring them means that you never say no to them, that you do exactly what they want, you don't set boundaries with them, and that was drilled into you over and over again. And they may have tried to use the Bible to reinforce that. Bring God into that. God will be, not be happy with you if you don't do it. And, and it was just there. And then you went to church, and that's what everybody in the community, in the culture, believed. And it was drilled into you. And then you come into recovery, and it's pointed out to you that your parents have, because of all of that, have caused you to not respect yourself, to not stand up for yourself, not just in your relationship with them, but in all kinds of relationships. And you realize if you're ever going to make it in life and have healthy relationships, you have to respect yourself enough to stand up for yourself and say no to people. Wow. To say no to my parents, to set a boundary with my parents. A war takes place in you. That goes against everything that was drilled into you. So whenever you go to change a deeply instilled belief that's happened since early life, that's not just believed by your family, but by your community or culture, and now you want to change that belief, it sends off shockwaves inside yourself and within the community. And that's what happened to Peter. So now Peter comes from this trance where God has lowered this sheet and then people show up and say there's this Gentile man Cornelius that wants to meet with you and he goes to Cornelius' house and Cornelius serves him ham and Peter says oh, this is okay now. Oh, this feels so weird. This feels so wrong, but I'm going to eat the ham anyways because God said it's clean now and he's got a war going on inside of him. But then he goes home that day and peep, the word is out. Peter was at a Gentile's house and he ate ham and now you got church leaders showing up saying, what's wrong with you, Peter? You're forsaking God's word. You got people now, when Peter walks down the street who just won't even look at him or say hi to him because they're embarrassed of him. He's failed them. And there would have been conflict. There would have been pressure. It would have been an extremely tense time that would happen in the church in Peter's life. But Peter stuck to his guns. 
he continued to follow God's new directions around food laws. But here's the part I want you to see. We're told this, Peter came to Antioch. And Paul says this, I had to oppose him to his face for what he did was very wrong. When he first arrived, he ate with the Gentile believers. He had a ham. He ate with people who were not circumcised and didn't make a big deal about it. But afterwards, some friends of James, who was a hard-line, stick-to-the-Jewish-laws person, some friends of James came, and when Peter saw them, he stopped eating with the Gentiles. He was afraid of the criticism from his own people who insisted on the necessity of circumcision. And as a result... Other Jewish believers followed Peter's example. And Paul says, I had to jump in and oppose Peter and tell him, you're wrong, you're doing damage to stop him. But here's what I want you to see. Peter went through that very, very difficult life change decision from never eat pork to it's okay to eat pork. But then he came to a time where there was so much pressure put on him, he regressed to the old behavior. And so what I want you to understand is this. If one of the greatest Christians living at that time could have a day where they regress to an old behavior, we can too. So if you find yourself doing well, but then you regress, don't beat yourself up. But Be sorry that you did it. Learn from it. Get back on track. And it will turn into a growth opportunity and growth will happen. But please don't beat yourself up. Peter, the great Peter, even he regressed. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your patience with us. Thank you that you're so gracious. And that you know that our journey of healing and growth is slow and messy. And and you're okay with that. And you keep working in our lives and forgiving us. And I just pray for any who are struggling, any who have regressed, that that you would just help them to accept your forgiveness and grace, that they would learn from it and continue to grow. Amen. Well, that's the end of our Friday night. Thanks again for being here.